United States and California, um, as well as in the United States. We're going closer and closer to personalizing education. So the idea is, what do you think personalizing education means? So actually, um, who would like to answer that question? What is personalizing education to you? Maybe the, to find a uh, new or a specific way to give um, knowledge people need in uh, this particular moment of time. Okay, great. That's I like that. So a new or specific way to give knowledge. And I like that you said um, to give it because to me that implies that you're like, here, I'm sharing with you, but not necessarily like, here, I'm pounding this into your head. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, any other ideas about personalizing we education? Can, we can improve ourselves. Okay, all right, absolutely. So we can focus on the specific needs that we have that we need to improve about ourselves, say, for example, study methods or study skills and improve those, okay, yeah? Okay, that's actually a nice transition to the next slide, which is how do we do this? And what you've said is a combination of independent or autonomous learning that some of us have learned about previously, quite a few times, um, as well as basic needs assessment that the schools would give out in terms of curriculum. So with the needs assessment, you're not only asking the um, Ministry of Education, but you're also asking the students what they feel their needs are, you know, where they feel that they are strong or weak. And you're also asking the parents of the students, because parents are frequently very aware of what their children are going through, and so they would know, mm, my son or my daughter is not so good at these specific study skills. I would like those to be also taught in school in addition to what I'm doing at home. So in terms of actually creating um, education so that it fits all learners. The idea is that you have independent or autonomous learning, uh, which we will talk about task-based learning. What's task-based learning? Who can tell me? Okay, so that's a great start. I like the description so far. What's the difference between a task and an activity? <laughs> I'm going to flip back in your notes to when we talked about that. <laughs> I know my tasks. That is a very good guess. <laughs> um, activity is something we do to gain our task. And test, it's a name. You guys are so close, so close. Okay, so we have activity. An activity is um, a, I guess, basic, just the basic work in class um, that fosters I'm going to say LL for language learning. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, activities can be done individually. And occasionally as a pair or group. Okay, that's the short abbreviation for group. A task is actually quite different. For a task, a task has to be completed within a group. So it's group based. And it's written so that all members of the group must participate. This is short for members. Another really important distinction is that with a task, you have to have something that you're measuring at the end. So there has to be something tangible that the teacher can see, yes, they completed it, or no, that they didn't complete it. So you're giving them, um, I'm trying to think of the best way to put this. Basic, I'll just say you, at the end, of given time, teacher, T for teacher, collects, can you see that, measurement of task. So the last time we talked about task, we had the example, um, an advice column. And the students had to write down the completion of their task was that the teacher collected a piece of paper that had the main ideas for the advice column they were going to write versus an activity where you could be talking about an advice column, but there, the teacher doesn't necessarily collect something at the end. And if you're just talking about the advice column, um, not everyone necessarily is forced to participate, but in a task when we have the advice column, we would have specific roles. So one person may represent a uh, journalist, another person may represent a <coughs> NGO worker, another person may represent an environmental activist if we were talking about oil spills in the ocean. And the, all those, they would each give the perspective of that character or role in order to complete the task. Similar to a role play, except for um, you're not necessarily having them pre present what they're talking about. They're like memorizing the information and giving the information. Um, but you're right, it is very similar to a role play, except for there's no performance aspect outside of the task itself, being engaged in the task itself. Is that clear? Mm -hmm. Any questions? Any area that I could help you to understand more? No? Okay, if there are any questions, feel free to ask. <laughs> I'm sure other people also have the same questions. So that's task-based learning, and with task-based learning, because it's specific and because it's meaning-based, that's another thing I forgot to add up here, this is meaning-based. So meaning-based pretty much means that you're asking students to use specific forms of the language in order for them to practice it, and so it's all about the production. Okay, so that's why it's considered communicative. Right, so meaning-based. The reason why this is more student-centered and individual to the student's needs is because obviously you would choose tasks that are relevant to what they need in the classroom as opposed to just giving them anything to do. Okay, project-based learning is um, something that's more long-term. Similarly to a task, you have 
group work, not necessarily in all cases, but the projects that I've normally done with students have been group-centered projects. And um, ideally, all members of the group must participate. You also, at the end of the given time, and possibly throughout the time period, you're collecting information from the group. So maybe the f you have stages. So the project has the first stage, the second stage, and then the final stage. Sort of like the concept of a portfolio, that everything builds on everything else, but um, not quite the same. It is also meaning-based. Okay, so these are um, the considerations. Again, we are looking at personalized education, right? So these are some of the ways that we can personalize education. We can choose projects that develop, again, specific skills or specific material that we need the students to be focused on. So say, for example, you had an element of health that had to be discussed in your curriculum, but the book that you're using didn't have that, but you still had to talk about it with students. So how could you do that? You could have a project within the curriculum that deals primarily with health, so you're supplementing what you have in the textbook and the limitations of the textbook with the project-based act, project activities. Does that make sense? I guess I should say task project-based tasks. Okay, so um, what we're going to talk about is just the basics of curriculum design and the need of students for English and how that alters or has been altering our practices as teachers and students and educators. So basic curriculum design, um, again this is about business English, so we have business English for EFL, ESL, uh, we have a needs analysis, and I sort of described already the needs analysis, where you're looking at the current students, future students, as well as past students to kind of get an idea of what are they actually using in the business world. How can we reform our curriculum to actually capture what it is they need? Also looking at the business world in general in terms of the research coming out of institutions and schools in terms of the projected future of business. What is it going to look like in 2015, 2020, et cetera, et cetera. It will be different than what we already know it to be. Can anyone name a difference they think that they're going to see in the business world? One thing that I see is um, downsizing of travel for businessmen and women around the world because it's very expensive. And now that we have Skype, we have um, Google, the component that's similar to Skype, we have Present Me, we have so many opportunities <coughs> online to give product demonstrations and presentations and or communicate with Tokyo tonight, for mm -hmm. example, or tomorrow morning because they're actually ahead of us. You know, why would you actually send a physical person when you could do it for free or for severely reduced prices? So that's one thing that might be changing. And how does that impact the classroom? How does that impact what we have to change students for in the future? Not change, but what we have to um, teach students about in the future. So that's looking a little bit, I mean, this is a very brief needs analysis. What else might you add to that? Who else would you interview in order to, to capture how business is changing. So I, because they would have to be able to manage websites right in the language of the web in English. Product descriptions, stuff like that, absolutely. Great suggestion or comment. What else? You're the business expert. <laughs> what else? E-banking. E-banking, <laughs> e okay, so again, being really intimately familiar with the online platforms that are out there for banking, for trade, for communication, for um, product development, logo development, marketing, etc. These are the things to think about. So, so what about be ready to 
present something in the foreign language. I mean, in the global language. Yeah. Question. Okay, absolutely. So making sure that the students, by the time they graduate from the business program, that they have a solid grasp of business English, some of the terminology and vocabulary that is uh, predominant in that. Absolutely. Um, so also we have matching course content to the target group. And this is basically thinking, do you know, do you have bankers? Mm -hmm. Or who, who, what kind of business people do you have? And then matching your content to suit the needs of that group. So I look at that also as you have the overarching needs in business, which, you know, the vocabulary, the um, letter of referral or recommendation, stuff like that. But then you have um, content specific. If you're going into logo design for business, that's content specific English that you would need to work on. Um, and creating materials for business English is something that we have to think about because when we look at all these needs, in every country, the needs are slightly different because most businesses want to be international, so you do have to train the international aspect, but what about, for example, the Ukrainian aspect? It's not necessarily, you don't sell here the way you would sell to an American. So looking at the content that you have for Business English, a lot of the time it's very much um, Eurocentric. So either from the US, the UK, or we even have some from Australia. So how does that fit into Ukrainian context, but also in English? Because in Ukraine we have many different people from many different countries trying to do business here and understanding the culture here. So the students would have to navigate that not only through English, the language, but also culturally. And we have to create materials to help them, well, to help train the students who are going to go into that environment, help them be able to better communicate with the other groups of people they're working with. And then um, we also have, of course, within curriculum design, writing the basic syllabus. And I think most of you are familiar with the syllabus. Okay. So these are some of the aspects that uh, students will need English for. Some of them we've already talked on, but we have communication, so that focuses on the four skills. They need to be able to write. They need to be able to read. They need to be able to speak, and they definitely need to be able to listen. And listening is really complicated in business because you have to listen to what was directly said and indirectly said, which goes right on into culture. <laughs> because part of listening has to do with culture. How do you pick up the nuances of what was indirectly stated? It's hard. Um, and also knowledge of and sensitivity to others. So being aware of how you ask a question can have an impact in the business negotiation succeeding or failing. Something that small. <laughs> Connections. So with business, it's so broad. You always have links to other fields, right? For example, there's a business around my favorite sport, scuba diving. There's scuba equipment, there's scuba schools, there's a lot of business attached to the scuba industry. And so thinking of other connections when you're going into design the business course, what are the connections you want to consider? You know, what, what are your students going to go into business for? And if you have a wide variety of students going into a wide variety of different businesses, that would be the perfect time to use projects, <laughs> right? Because then you can put them together, the ones that will be in the same business field, and have them continue to study more in depth what they will be doing um, in the future, and gaining the knowledge, the background knowledge that they'll need within that field, the vocabulary they'll need within that field, uh, while also maintaining the core curriculum of your specific business class. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Um, and then community. So how are you going to connect whatever you're doing in class outside of class? And um, this is something that we do a lot in the U.S., right? Whenever we have classes, especially business and un universities and colleges, we have internships that students sign up for. And they go and they, um, they have, they can like shadow, that's the word. I was thinking ghost, and I'm like, it's not ghost but they shadow a professional in the field for a series. It could be a day, it could be a week, it could be a month, and they just follow that professional around. And sometimes they can help them with small tasks and get to know what it's like to be in their field. And or the, um, the internship itself would be having the student go and work in a business environment at a business setting and get course credit for it. They wouldn't... It, Generally speaking, internships are non-paid, or they're like very, very <clears throat> minimally paid. For example, sorry, my voice is going. <laughs> For example, you may have um, taxi money, or like bus fare, or uh, metro fare, or something like that, that's covered by the stipend of the internship, but that's it. So they're not actually taking a salary, but they get a small stipend to help them commute to the location where the business is. Okay, so those are the project work. Um, it is argued, and you can see that this is um, the link. There's a really nice article about um, these, the four C's, if you will of what we need in, Engl in the English classroom. And this is from, um, I forgot, it's the, the Japanese TESOL organization. It's called JALT. I don't remember the exact acronym. But uh, McKenzie, I believe it's Alan McKenzie wrote this. And it's a very nice article about um, how and why we need to consider these four C's in our business. Well, in our curriculums in general, you can see this isn't only about business, but in English curriculum, full stop. Okay, so in terms of the four skills for listening and speaking, these are some of the things we very much um, have to take into consideration. So we have the sales meetings. So leading and participating, what does this mean? What does it mean to sit in a business meeting and run the business meeting? What does it mean to be a participant in the business meeting? How much of that is dependent on the culture of the business? For example, if you go to Google and you're working in Google on their business team, you're going to have a very different experience than if you go to, say, Kiev Star and go to one of their business meetings. I can guarantee it's going to be a very different experience. Mm -hmm. So how do you prepare the students in terms of their listening and speaking to actively participate in these sorts of environments? Um, hiring and letting staff go, also very difficult. Mm -hmm. um, marketing campaign. So my, my favorite, and I'm sure that Natasha, you have plenty of these, but my favorite one was originally, I have to make sure I get this right, so I'm going to look at this, but originally in um, China, when Kentucky Fried Chicken entered their market, <laughs> um, we, in Kentucky Fried Chicken, the slogan is finger licking good, meaning it's so good you want every last bit from your fingers, but when they translate it into Chinese, it said, eat your fingers off instead of finger licking good. So you can imagine that nobody wanted to go to KFC. Um, so, and there are a lot of parts like that where being, sorry, um, Coca-Cola was also really funny. Their slogan was, bite the wax tadpole. And then they changed it to happiness in the mouth which sounds a lot more appealing than <laughs> by the wax tadpole. So I love, I love marketing slogans because they're really, really funny when they're wrong. <laughs> and they make for really great examples 
in class. Um, okay, let me just make, okay, so that's what I wanted to say about marketing campaigns. Also, we have office meetings, we have interviews. The way that you are in interviews in the United States is very different than Great Britain, is very different than Australia. There's just very, there's a lot of um, cultural components that need to be considered. And it would be the same thing that you would want to teach in a business <coughs> curriculum. Making presentations. How do you give presentations? It's been really interesting because um, last, was it, no, it wasn't last week. Several weeks ago, I did a Pecha Kucha presentation. And the Pecha Kucha presentation was started for architects in Japan. And um, not everybody could accept the Pecha Kucha presentation because it was so different from the presentation style that we're used to. So I think it's really important, especially in a business context, to be able and willing to be flexible and adaptable about your presentation skills and what works in what culture and to whom. So also uh, telephone conversations with clients. You can imagine that's very difficult, especially since you don't have the face-to-face. -face. You can't mime, <laughs> unless you're on Skype, of course. Reading and writing. So we have to consider email. This is really important. A lot of the students that I have, um, even the ones that left the school and were still writing me, and these are people who are going into the business world, because when I was working in Macau, we had a lot of people going into business or finance, because it's a huge center of finance. And um, they would sign off the emails, or they would begin the emails with Dearest Eve, and they would sign off the emails with, like, with all my love, <laughs> with my, uh, you know, all these extraordinarily inappropriate ways to sign off a business email. <laughs> and so making sure that students really know how to write properly so that they're not offending accidentally the person that they're sending the email to. Um, proposals are another important thing, understanding your audience. I see a lot of proposals uh, for, um, let's see, for Fulbright ETAs or for Fulbright applicants. Um, also in terms of, I've seen several proposals for projects that people wish to develop in the future. And what strikes me about this is a lot of the times students and or professionals, they don't actually read the information on the website of the people that they're trying to give the proposal to. They don't know how to underline the main objectives and the main idea and fit the proposals into the mission statement of the organization. These are not what they're taught to do, but they're crucially important to whether or not your proposal is accepted. Making sure that you sound like you could represent the company in the way that they would like to be seen. Grants, same thing. Claim adjustment letters, sales letters, inquiries. These are all components of reading and writing responding to inquiries and requests for information. This is difficult because oftentimes it comes off as bossy mm -hmm. or really like, gimme, gimme, gimme. Mm -hmm. And that's not what the person intended to write. Account terms and conditions, business report, and a business memo. So these are not the entirety of what you would be doing for Business English, but they are a lot of what we do commonly work on with students for Business English. Presentation of ideas, that they're in a logical order and that they're explained and defended with rational reasons and logic. Uh, social interaction, ability to schmooze, do social ple pleasantries. Do you know what schmooze means? Mm -hmm. It means like when you go to the party and it's a business function 
and you're able to talk to people and you can talk to anybody for any amount of time and you're really good at that, that's what schmoozing is. It's a fun word to have. No, it's not any yeah, close. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, yeah, it's not schmuck. <laughs> <laughs> totally different meaning. <laughs> um, it's also funny. Yeah, it is. No, that's true. It is. So we want to, with this, we, we focus on all aspects of the four skills, right? You have to understand clearly the target audience of who you're either talking to, writing to, or reading, or listening to. Integration. So how would we do, we presenting a, we've presented a lot of information, right? We have the cultural component, we have the language component, we have teaching communication. It's a lot of different things to consider when we're talking about creating a curriculum. And so one of the ways that we could integrate this is that some of these topics could be taught in what we call a common module. Does anyone know what a common module is? Okay. It's yeah, like, go for uh, it. Several components in, uh, mm -hmm. in, one, uh, in one module. Yeah, for example, uh, that could be part of it, yeah. For example, uh, <laughs> we have uh, listening, uh, speaking, reading, writing. And uh, we, uh, we give uh, 10 hours for reading, 10 hours for speaking, 10 hours for reading. And then in, in these uh, categories, in these skills, we have another uh, topics to, uh, to analyze, to work on, and, and other things. That's a great guess. No, it's not good. <laughs> but it was a good guess. Good yeah. try. <laughs> I didn't see anybody else trying, so good try. <laughs> okay, so a common module um, can be completed online. Well, it's common module plus online learning. And basically what we're looking at is we're trying to integrate all of these aspects. So we start with a common module. And basically what you're doing is you're having all the students who are studying, for example, business, since that's what we're talking about, at the beginning of the semester come together to learn a series of information that they all have to know. So it could be writing business letters. And so what this would look like is that all the students would be together in like, um, maybe, you would maybe you couldn't have all of them together. But what we did at the University of Macau is we had them come in shifts and so we would we would have maybe three classes together and then another three classes together and then another three classes together and they would come in and we would team teach what a business letter is and what is a good business letter and then they would have activities to practice and then we would meet them again in you know one class with their teacher and then we would go over the homework and the assignments that was discussed in the common module. And so this went on for four weeks out of a 16-week semester. And the reason for that was they had a lot of things that they had to learn that were kind of like an umbrella of the business curriculum. Everybody had to know it. And so what you could do within the common module is you got the fundamentals of the business letter. So those beginning students could work on it to the best of their ability. You would give them a scaffolded business letter where maybe they would be filling in just a few areas, but there were like huge chunks of words that were written, you know, sentences to help them to craft the business letter. And the more advanced students may be having a slightly different assignment because they also met with their course teacher during that same week, they were able to cater the overall class to their individual needs as well at whatever level they were. So that's the common module. Again, that happens for four weeks and it's an, a way to teach all of the really necessary things like we just talked about in listening, speaking, reading, writing.
those elements that are core. You also have the independent or autonomous learning. And what we've discussed about that before is basically it starts from the beginning of the semester. The students identify an area that they would like to work on for themselves, whether it be reading, uh, grammar, vocabulary, speaking, listening. They create a study plan for themselves. <clears throat> and it is teacher-led as well, or teacher-facilitated, not led. That's the wrong word. Teacher-facilitated. And what they're doing is they're taking responsibility for their own learning. They're creating reflection on their own learning through journals every few weeks to assess what they've done so far, whether or not it's helped their learning in any way, and what they need to do in the future to be more effective. And they can, you know, if you didn't want to have them working on a skill, they could probably also, through independent learning, be working on something that's specific to their major. So if you had a lot of business English majors, but one was in banking, you know, that student for part of their independent learning could work specifically on banking components and learning more information and developing their uh, repertoire of knowledge about banking. Then we have task-based learning. So again, task-based learning would be to have the students have a lot of opportunities in class when you do meet with them after the common module has finished to do specific tasks related to business, obviously. Project, we already talked about in terms of allowing that to be another opportunity for them to um, be more focused on something specific that they're studying. Or you could use it like we did a practice thing where our students created universities. So they had to review websites of universities and they had to come up with um, their mission statement, their goals for admission, their goals for the students, like what the university consisted of, um, logos for the university. They had to have a presentation where they were trying to get other students to come to their university. There were a lot of considerations and basically it was project or product development. They're developing a university as a product that they want to engage other students to come to. And we had them um, in the library of our institution. They ha we had a fake university fair. And they set up posters of their universities, they made flyers for their universities, and they had to try and nab students and get them to come to their university. And um, whichever team collected the most, like, I am willing to leave the University of Macau and join your university, they had little stickers that <laughs> the students could give to the people who created the universities. Whoever had the most of those, they got like a prize. Because <laughs> they were the most convincing in their sales pitch for their university. So that's an example of a project for business English. You could cater it more towards like product development. University is very vague. You know, it could be like a new Coca-Cola or something like that. Okay, Oops, I think we already pretty much talked a lot about Common Module. So four to eight weeks, um, basics taught to large groups, core curriculum taught by teacher teams, study skills also taught, I didn't say that, study skills also taught by teacher teams. So oftentimes we assume that students know study skills already, and frequently they don't. They don't know how to read and annotate. They don't know many different strategies that we often believe that they know. And so study skills was actually a part of our common module because we identified that our students had a really hard time with creating study plans. Like, you know, there, I think I used this example before, but it was really pertinent to me, which was, you know, I said, okay, you're going to have your autonomous learning, independent learning set up, and some of the students would write back, you know, I'm going to study listening. I want to improve my listening skills, and I'm going to listen to a movie every single night for two hours. And it's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> Who has time to watch a movie 
for two hours every evening and complete all their other homework. You're either not going to be listening to the movie because you're going to be doing all your other homework while the movie is playing in the background, or you're not going to be doing any of your other homework and then you're going to come back and blame it on me. Mm -mm, I don't think so. <laughs> so like actually teaching, you know, it's better to do small amounts of study and really put yourself behind them like five, ten minutes a day would be helpful as opposed to like these seriously elongated periods of time because after a while it doesn't go in anymore, you know. <laughs> you have to give your brain a break. Um, and as I said, the small classes met weekly. They review assignments, whatever was given, and there is individual work as well as group work and pair work within the context of the small classes. And after either the fifth week or the ninth week, there's no more common module. Okay. I also talked about independent autonomous learning with the learning journal, creating goals for skill development, listening to and reporting on speakers in their field. And what's great about Business English is there's so much on TED. You know, I'm always talking about TED and how wonderful it is. It really is that wonderful. And there's so much for business on TED that you could literally assign for all four years of university or if you're doing secondary school with this, like you could literally assign a TED Talk a week for the students to listen to and have them all four years listening to different TED Talks. Like, it's extraordinary what they can do. And also, of course, using other um, web resources. Okay, Just um, to say a little bit more about listening to and reporting on speakers, what that means is they listen to, say, for example, the TED Talk, or they're listening to um, business on BBC or on NPR or even VOA. And then they actually have a questionnaire that they fill out so that they become more comfortable and confident in um, cultural norms of delivery of information. So who speaks? When do they speak? What is the appropriate turn taking? What are some of the clues or cues that they can use to recognize, ah, okay, this person wants me to speak now or, oops, <laughs> I should be quiet and listen at this point. Um, these are inf information that <clears throat> you can help them to become aware of by having an activity like this that they complete on their own outside of class. The only thing that you're doing as the teacher is double checking that they actually did it. Okay, And then you have loads of web resources for business. Um, this is, I, you've seen this before, some of you, but this is the, an example of an independent learning website where you would have information about the teacher or about the course. And then here you might have um, a sample syllabus, and on the sample syllabus, oops, that's a, a real one, but on the sample syllabus, here you would have, for example, the exact dates, You'd have the materials, you would have what the assignment is, they would have to follow, they would have to take more responsibility for their participation in the course um, because you're giving them all the information ahead of time, including rubrics, any grading criteria, etc., etc. Uh, this is an example of a business English course, talks about, you know, here's the, the introduction. This is about the getting started. This is taken from Boston University. It's a colleague um, of mine. And she, basically what, the, what she does is she either created herself or she took from YouTube. Basically, how do you use the site? Because independent learning is frequently very new, sorry, I spit, <laughs> frequently very new for learners. And they don't really know how to be an independent learner. So part of our responsibility as the teacher is actually to teach them how can you be an independent learner? What should you do? What are your responsibilities? Because they're now different from a traditional classroom. 
so of different free resources um, like Dropbox or any of the, the wiki pages like Wet Paint or something like that that you could use Audacity for recording um, that would allow you to put all this information online so that it's easily accessible to the students. Here's the wikis in education. This is another free resource um, where you can go and hopefully create something like this which is a screenshot of a um, an economics class. So you can see here there's some of the course listings such as the course information. Um, you have also intro to economics and microeconomics, microeconomics, international economics, development economics, etc., etc. So you can see that students can easily come to the front page and see that. These are all of the different um, settings that they can also go to, depending on what they needed to do for the day. What I like about this, too, is that the teacher has made to sure to put the rules of conduct here. Because one thing that students frequently don't realize, and oftentimes we don't realize, is when we're writing emails to each other or when we're having a discussion, um, I think he had a discussion page here, right? Yeah, see that? Discussions. There are actually a lot of free resources that you can have discussions on. Um, when you have a discussion, the tone of your email, it's very, very, or the tone of your post, it's very, very easy to misinterpret it to be angry or um, belligerent and offend other students. So you have to be very careful with your choice of words. And I found that <clears throat> my students would frequently use like emotions, you know, like smiley faces or something like that to lighten the, what could be perceived as a bad tone in their email, even though it wasn't a bad tone. It may have been more like business-like, you know, very straightforward. But other people are like, oh, that was so mean. And um, so just putting a smiley face at the end or something like that was something that they themselves started doing. Um, so those are things to think about. Moodle is another one, but this, is n this one is not free. On Google, there's also a course setting where you can do all of this for free on Google. And they, have, they actually have a fantastic setup where you can link to YouTube, you can do all kinds of things, all for free. Um, nice thing about Moodle is they also have a lot of information that you can probably look at yourself and then use that to create your Google course. <laughs> so use all the tips and ideas that you can get from this section of uh, Moodle. There's more here. And there's also, oh, anyway, there's, there are webcasts, but I guess I didn't put them in there. If you have, um, iUniversity is something that has been started as well, and so you can sign up for iUniversity to do your courses online through them. Um, again, not free, but it is very easy to use, very navigable, and if your, um, if your university would be willing to front the money for it, it might be something to look into because a lot of the students have, at least a lot of my students in Macau, they all had iPads or iPhones. And so with iUniversity, it was very easy for them to access the information anywhere. Here's some information again with iUniversity about uh, course materials, like how you would do audio and video, how you would do presentations, how you would do documents, um, PDFs, and iBooks for textbooks. So you could create the iBooks online and have it catered to your specific course. That's one of the, um, the reasons that I really like iUniversity. Oh dear, did I not put it in here? So there's another one that I think I didn't actually add to this. Oh, that's a shame. Okay, and I'm just going to describe it to you, but it's called um, Cloud cloud learning, I think, and it's from Japan, and it's 
they they haven't actually become public yet. They're still creating the information. But what's amazing about this is that they have the grading tool embedded in the web platform. They have participation also embedded in the web web platform as as well as all of this kind of stuff. And so it's a really nice way, this web page, to um, include all of that. And it's up and coming. Um, so not a lot of information is out yet, but mm -hmm. if you wanted to Google like cloud language, I will, I'll find it at the end of the presentation and put it up so you can see the page and watch their demo video of what teachers should be able to do. Um, it's really, really exciting. <laughs> I'm not so excited about it. So other things that you want to embed or link to, I mentioned TED for business. Um, and this was actually, this is not business, <laughs> this is education. But this is the man who I quoted from to begin with. And um, I wanted to just encourage you to look at this talk. As an example of what TED would look like, you can see that you can get the transcript in many different languages here. You can also download, and when you click this button, it'll come up where it will allow you to choose to download with subtitles. And then according to how long the TED Talk has been online, you can choose what language the subtitles you would like. Obviously for us, we'd want to do English. But if our learners maybe aren't as advanced, um, we might consider having Ukrainian or Russian subtitles. It's a possibility. It, I mean, it really depends on your goal with the information. But yeah, try to uh, watch him. He's fantastic. Um, Sir Ken Robinson. The next thing that I really like is with TED, you can actually link the Huffington Post has blogs on the weekend. And basically what they do is one of the writers watches a TED post and then writes their opinions about the speaker and about the research um, or about the topic. And what I like to do is give this to the students, have them watch the original TED video, and then have a discussion on do they agree or disagree with what the author <coughs> proposes based on their interpretation of the TED Talk. So it's, nice, it's a nice way to stimulate discussion. Other discussion stimulators are NPR. Um, why did I, there, okay. So I was gonna, I tried to find stuff that had business. Um, Gun debate actually has a lot to do with the National Rifle Association, which has to do with business, big business in the U.S., because they produce a lot of guns and have a commitment to selling them all. <laughs> so that might be linked to business in a way. Um, this is a really nice website. You can listen to all their programs, and they very frequently have transcripts. You can see here this is an example of... Um, when you click listen, what it will look like, you can create a playlist and you can share these, meaning you can embed it onto your um, independent learning website. You can also hear, if there's a transcript, you can download the transcript as well and show it to students or give it to students. And this one is not very long, you can see. It's only four minutes and what, five, five seconds? Yes, five seconds. And so I like these because they're very short and I can have students listen to them either in class or out of class as a means of stimulating discussion. Okay. This is VOA. So you can do this in special English or you can do the regular one. And I, I chose this one because you can see here they have world economic form rates um, and they're talking about global risk taking. You can have, um, there's a lot of economics in here. Um, budget decision, health reform, well that's not really, well it has to do with economics. Um, balance of power, stuff like that. 
So I also use VOA. They have MP3s that you can download as well. They have transcripts. And sometimes, in the special English programming, they also have things such as, um, excuse me, downloadable flashcards and puzzles and like crossword puzzles and stuff like that. Um, also other activities. So VOA is a very nice website to use. In terms of task-based learning, um, this is not really task-based learning, sorry. What I might have them do with this information is have them follow what their, the topic of their studies is. And they're writing journals about the topic of their studies. And then I group them into small groups in the class. So we're getting the group-based participation. And they have to discuss their different articles and come up with advice. Or come up with, I mean, there could be in any number of things. Come up with a product based on the articles. Or um, come up with a slogan, whatever it is that they're doing. So that would be the way that I would do task-based learning. So there's a component of the independent learning where they're writing the journals by themselves to gather the information and become a so-called expert, right? Kind of like we were talking about with the role-playing. And then once they're put together into the groups, they can um, discuss and each has important amount of information to contribute. And then you have the presentations, the group presentations of the products or the skills. Questions? I think I'm going fairly quickly. And yet we're still almost out of time. Ha <laughs> ha. Okay, so some of the places that I have them look for information. You promise to find Yes, I this day, the New York Times. This is very nice. Um, there's a lot of, there's just a lot of stuff there. We have markets, economy, energy, media, technology, blah, 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 all about business. Okay, I also have students, because I like to have a wide variety of news, I also have them looking, say, for example, at Al Jazeera. There's also a business section on Al Jazeera. I want them to see as many viewpoints as possible, because I want them to think critically. And I want them to look at, okay, that's interesting. This is being said in this media, but this is being said in this other media. So what's my opinion about what's going on? So that's what I want them to be doing. Um, Huffington Post, again, for the business section. That's another newspaper that I frequently have them uh, use. Here's an example of the business section from that. Um, it's fun because it's very inter interactive. You might also have them do a blog based on what they were doing. Business, business Ethics, Magazine of Corporate Responsibility. So I like that because I really want them to start being introduced to business ethics, right? <laughs> Is it something they're going to have to know about? And we may not be teaching them. In terms of business ethics as well, so it's really hard for me today to say that word for some reason, I might also have them look into the ethicist. Is that the right spelling? Ethicist? No, it's not right? What did I do wrong? Oh, you're saying you're just like <laughs> being, okay. So the ethicist, just Google this. This is on NPR. And what I do is I Google the ethicist NPR. What's nice about the ethicist is you have, I think his name is Randy Cohen. Yeah, I think that's it. So you may want to add Randy Cohen to that. But he talks about ethics. So people will write in with a question about, hey, this occurred. What would the ethical thing to do be? And then he has a discussion on what would the ethical thing to do be. And so it's really interesting to have the students listen to that and then discuss, you know, is that ethical for this cultural context? 
do you agree with the ethicist? Because sometimes I found that my students, you know, they were like, no. <laughs> they didn't agree with the ethicist. So it was nice to have those discussions, though, because it helped widen their view. And it also helped to teach ethics. <laughs> okay, so that's the end of um, the different newspapers or journals that I use. Occasionally, I run to the Harvard Gazette, which is online, and they have pretty good business articles occasionally, but not always. A lot of it is obviously about Harvard and like what's going on, et cetera, et cetera. So another thing that I like them to use are prezies, because a lot of students are very familiar with the style of presentation that I'm doing right now. So we're going through PowerPoint, it's like boom, 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 step, 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 step. But what Prezi's do is they kind of mix everything up. They make the PowerPoint more interactive and more interesting to watch. And they also encourage them to think like, when you design a Prezi, you actually have to sit down and think, okay, what is the metaphor I'm going to use to convey this idea? And so you have to really, you know, is it going to be the tree of life? or something similar? What is it that is seemingly unconnected but very connected to my topic? Um, so that's why I like Prezi's for business. Another part of Prezi's, as you can see, is you have resumes and portfolios. So in the business world, this is very important to have a resume that, or a CV that you are writing. You can do them online. Um, and portfolios, what have they produced? If they're a graphic designer, they definitely have to have a portfolio, right? How are they going to get hired if they don't? <laughs> you have to be able to say, yes, I designed this, isn't it wonderful? I designed this too. And I designed this and it made millions of dollars, so hire me. Mm -hmm. um, and then we also have Prezi's for students and educators. So this would be something that if you're not teaching business, you could also do with students who are not in the business um, field. So present me. You can either put your own presentations up or you can watch presentations that have already been put up. There are millions of presentations online of all manner of speaking. And what's nice about this is this prepares students for um, long distance sorts of presentations. Like if they were to do something over Skype, your way of being when you're online is much, much different than your way of being when you're with an audience, right, in the flesh. So what's nice about this is on this side, you would have the PowerPoint or a video or whatever it was that you wanted to show the people you were talking to, and obviously you have yourself. And so you just, you're talking them through the slides. This is really nice, and I really think that this will be used for something similar, because there's a lot of software like this out there. I think even Google has something like this for free. Mm -hmm. But um, what I like about this is you can, you can be dealing with business in California <coughs> and living in Ukraine and need to make a presentation, put it online, and when they wake up in the morning, they can go in their presentation room, they can watch it, they can email you questions, and you don't actually have to stay up until 3 o'clock in the morning to make the presentation when you're dead tired, mm -hmm. right? So it's, it's very nice, and that's why I think it will become more and more popular. Um, I think it's also really interesting to think about how to be when you're having a Skype call and to practice it because students have to watch themselves in order to put everything together and so they <clears throat> they really get clear about <laughs> woo it doesn't work when you know I didn't realize that I'm always going like this you know <laughs> or like playing with my hair or something like that and that doesn't work mm -hmm. I have a really really embarrassing one that I read about the other day it was so gross <laughs> And I'm going to share it with you because it was so gross. <laughs> anyway, so I was reading The New Yorker, which is this famous magazine that comes out of New York, obviously. And it normally has literary content in it. But occasionally there are other stories and some s political stuff as well. And one of the commenters was talking about this man who he had a long-distance Skype phone call with. And the guy 
First of all, he put the computer so close to him that it was like a big head. <laughs> and then he had cut himself shaving and put a Band-Aid under it, over it, sorry. And so he was so nervous during the conversation, he was just going like this a lot, and he accidentally scratched the Band-Aid off, and it started bleeding, and then he was putting blood all over his face. <laughs> Isn't that terrible? <laughs> and the people watching were just like, ah! <laughs> but nobody really, what do you say? Let's take a break. You might want to go to the bathroom and look at yourself in the mirror, right? So if he had practiced ahead of time with something like Prezi, this would not have been an issue. So it's uh, something to think about. <laughs> um, and this is, again, another Prezi for business. Oops, I think this just gives you the last, the next slide. Yes, Prezi for nonprofits, Prezi for conferences. TED uses Prezi. And you can see that their, um, their style of presentations is very animated and very interactive. And that's really, really nice. I was actually, in a little aside, I was thinking about that today because I was at a symposium at National Aviation University this morning giving a talk. My talk was very different from everybody else's talk. Everybody else was just reading. And I am have my PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. I'm like going through bits and pieces. I read a little bit. But people were just like, <laughs> I got the sense that some of them didn't take me seriously because I was not reading from an academic mm -hmm. paper. You know, I was condensing the academia into a PowerPoint and sharing through storytelling, which in my mind is more effective. But it was a very interesting cultural moment this morning. So that just, it's in terms of like business, that was a good learning experience. <laughs> okay, project-based learning. Um, an example of this would be product creation and sales, which I mentioned to you when I talked about the university project where they had to create a university and sell it. Um, a company creation. These are examples. You know, you could go through the steps in creating and branding a company and trying to get it on the market. Um, ooh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to kick you. One wonderful thing, you know, I'm always on about Khan Academy, because I think it's brilliant. But did you know that on Khan Academy, you have finance and capital markets? You have a whole portion on economics. And so you could use this for your independent learning to link them to the site. And then they get a specific report from Khan Academy saying, I've completed this much successfully. What better assessment tool do you need? Right? Mm -hmm. Because it's got all the, it shows how much time they've been on there, how many videos they've watched, etc., etc. Um, in terms of the writing, I also have them linked to Grammar Girl. So Grammar Girl, they can go through, and if they have questions about specific things, like the difference, uh, when do you use who and when do you use whom? It's confusing. When do you use which? When do you use that? Also confusing sometimes for students. So they can go to this site when they recognize that they have something that they have a confusion about, or have confusion about, not a confusion, and they can... They can look at it and listen and get grammar lectures online. How fantastic is that, right? Because what they probably maybe should have learned, you know, six months ago or one year ago, <laughs> if they forgot it, it's no problem because they can find it again. And she does a very good job of explaining and giving examples. So I like, I mean, I myself use Grammar Girl because my grammar is not always so fabulous. And I do have questions, like, wait a minute, who and whom? I've forgotten since fifth grade when I learned that. You know, <laughs> it's been a few years. <laughs> so we go back to um, personalized education to the people you are actually teaching. 
So I hope that through this presentation you can see how it was personalized or could be personalized to the students that we're teaching through the different um, common module activities that I introduced as well as through the different autonomous independent learning ideas or activities that I introduced. So the last thing is um, again go see Mr. Robinson, Sir Ken Robinson, he has a really, really great one. Do schools kill creativity? Sometimes do. He says they definitely do. <laughs> and I, I think that you should all go and watch it, and we can talk about it next time. <laughs> maybe, maybe that can be one of the uh, Friday afternoon discussion group topics. Do skill, schools kill creativity? Um, he has some very definite <laughs> ideas about that. Thanks for your time and attention. Um, please don't forget to look for us um, at eConnect, the social network for teachers and learners of English. It is um, up and coming. We just started it last fall, and we're still working on making it better. We have some ideas. But if you join, you can see like the Relo's there, our Relo assistants are there, the fellows are there, um, and so, we hope to continue to make it bigger so that as teachers, we can connect with each other. And then finally, some of the references for this presentation are um, Brown, HD, Brown, JD, uh, Clark, and that those are mainly for curriculum design and effective curriculum management, and then Graves, Kathleen Graves for designing language courses. Okay. So now I need to find you that language cloud website so that you know how to find it before I forget, and then I'll take questions. Is that cool? Cheers. So that's language cloud. There was some other website that I learned about this last weekend that TESOL Ukraine, and I'll, I think it's like. Yeah. Free video chat and instant messaging. So this could be something that you would add um, if you wanted to have independent learning, something that you could use with the students. And obviously, you could video chat for free with up to 12 friends at once. That could be, you know, you could have groups video chat. Um, you wouldn't be able to have all of your students video chat if you have more than 11, because you would be the 12th person. But it's one way that you could manage group work. Questions, comments, concerns? Mm. And, uh, this cloud, uh, cloud uh, lab, or not lab? Cloud it's a Japan. platform. Yeah. So what, it, what you would do with it is if you... Um, if it's hopefully free and you're able to sign up for it um, once it becomes available, you would hold your class online and you could use it as a platform. Mm -hmm. And the students would be able to, you know, get their the syllabus, their activities. They would be able to have chats mm -hmm. online with each other. Um, and it means they are not chat. in the same room. They are not in the same room. Each class would yeah. have a different... Okay, yes. Yeah, and they're exactly. in different places. Yeah, um, mm. Maybe it's possible. Pro it's, it, it, I'm, yeah, it might be possible. It seemed like it was more... From what I understood from the video, I would recommend watching the video, yeah, yeah. but what I understood from the video was that it is best if it's not necessarily long distance. Right, that if it's just something that supplements what's already going on in the classroom, mm -hmm. and you use it as a part of the classroom, oh, okay. but not in the classroom at home, mm -hmm. like it's their classroom, but at home. Oh, okay. And we have uh, my language lab from uh, London. They have this uh, like market leader. They have. Uh, Totally English and other books, and they have uh, this my lab, my grammar lab, and my language lab. So it's like uh, we work together with students. Uh, we give like 
journal of, mm -hmm. the, uh, of your activities and uh, things it's like curriculum too. Great, it's great, yeah. Something similar. It is absolutely similar. There are a lot of things out there. Mm -hmm. um, so, and just so everyone hears what you just suggested, you said it was Pearson's? Yeah, Pearson, yeah, Pearson okay. Longman. Yeah, yeah, Pearson Longman have a language lab. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's similar to Moodle, probably. Mm, yeah. But it's Absolutely. specific for language. Moodle can be any course mm -hmm. online. Mm -hmm. Great. So it's, it's good. Good. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of uh, uh, special equipment, equipment like uh, mm. uh, you know, computers or uh, <laughs> yeah, for everyone. And right. We do not have uh, oh, laptops or uh, I don't know. Yeah. Things. That is good. Well, and I think that that's one thing that for me, I feel like when students have independent learning, mm -hmm. if as long as you have a computer lab in the center, it doesn't matter if they're doing it in class, mm -hmm. because the idea of no, no worries, I'm 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 right there with you. <laughs> the idea is that you would take the learning and they would do it outside, as opposed to everybody sitting in one room together. Mm -hmm and doing a listening together. So you, I think that there's room for both ways. Yeah. Because together on a listening is, could be important, especially if you're doing follow-up activities, like they have to talk about it or something like that, uh, making it interactive. But I also like the idea of doing independent listening because I would rather my students being something where, doing something in the class where they're communicating and practicing because I know they're not gonna do that when they leave my classroom. <laughs> I know them. <laughs> and they never do that. <laughs> but they will listen, because listening is safe. <laughs> Any other questions, comments, suggestions? That was a good one. No, thank you. Thank you all for your attention. And some of you have had a very long day.